Paul Krugman is one of the preeminent economists of our time, having won the 2008 Nobel Prize in Economics for his groundbreaking work on international trade and economic geography. He also is well known as a regular op-ed columnist for the New York Times, where he speaks the truth as he sees it in the most compelling terms. In addition to the Nobel Prize, Professor Krugman was also awarded the American Economic Association's John Bates Clark Medal for his work on international trade. He is the author or editor of more than 20 books, including End This Depression Now, The Great Unraveling, a New York Times bestseller, and an update edition of his 1999 book, The Return of Depression Economics, titled The Return of Depression Economics and the Crisis of 2008. Paul Krugman is a professor of economics and distinguished scholar at the Graduate Center's Luxembourg Income Study Center at City University of New York. Previously, he was professor of economics at Princeton University. Well noted for his Bitcoin and crypto economy skepticism, we are very proud and excited to have him here with us today on the Block Ventures XBB stage. Please give a warm welcome to Professor Paul Krugman. Hi, everybody. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to say thanks to the organizers for having me here. Um, I'm uh, the designated skeptic, I think, here. I'm supposed to be the bad guy, so I'll try to do that uh, politely. Um, let me say, I, I have no pretense of being an expert in the fundamentals of blockchain. Um, everyone tells me that it's ingenious, it's elegant, um, and it's uh, maybe even profound. Uh, the problem that someone like me, so what I do know something about, I hope, is money and the working of a monetary economy. Uh, the problem that I have, fundamentally what this comes down to, is that fairly often blockchain enthusiasts bring to mind the old line about a little boy with a hammer to whom everything looks like a nail. Uh, the question you always want to be asking is, what problem? is this supposed to be solving? Not is it clever, not is it smart, um, but what is the problem it's gonna solve? And let me step back from that to talk about what is really, I think, the fundamental issue. So I, I'm not gonna talk really about blockchain uses in general. I really am gonna talk only about cryptocurrency and only really within that about Bitcoin, but uh, um, I think some of what I have to say may generalize. Uh, what is money? Why do we have money? What, what's, what is money supposed to be doing? And if you step back from it a bit, you say that really money is, it's a, as a, the late Paul Samuelson put it, it's a social contrivance. It's a, it's a system that is basically about enforcing accounting. It's basically about enforcing that what people give is equal in value to what they get. That's, money is just a, a clever way of doing that. Uh, that doesn't require, you know, that, that is, uh, uh, makes it much easier to solve the, the problem of uh, double coincidence of wants. You know, what, uh, there are things I have and there are things I want, but what the people who have what I want may not want what I have. And so you need some system that allows me to get stuff that, you know, if, if I'm a brain surgeon and I want a refrigerator, I want to be able to find somebody with a refrigerator who doesn't need brain surgery. So that's, that's what money is about. But it's... It, at a fundamental level, it's, it's just about accounting. It's just about making sure that the thing works. And because it's about accounting, um, what you want from a monetary system, uh, other things being equal, is you want it to have the lowest overhead possible. What a monetary system is supposed to do, and the direction of evolution of monetary systems over time, has been towards keeping that overhead as low as possible, towards reducing the costs of transactions towards reducing the costs of supplying money, whatever it may be, um, as you know, making it, it more and more frictionless, making it a, a minimum cost system. Um, if you look at over time, you know, once upon a time money was gold and silver coins, um, which was a huge improvement over barter, uh, but gold and silver coins are, they can be heavy. Um, if you're going to be making use of them, you've got to uh, safeguard them, transporting them is difficult and risky. 
Uh, so that what you've seen over the centuries is a progressive evolution towards um, uh, systems that, t towards, if you like, more and more uh, uh, abstract systems that don't make use of something heavy, physical, costly to produce, like gold and silver coins. Uh, if you go back to where did banking really come from, uh, the early stages, if you ask, what did the Medicis do? What, what, was, what was their main function in society? It was actually mainly um, a way of transporting purchasing power without having to uh, lug gold and silver coins across. If you wanted to, uh, to if you were in Florence and you wanted to buy something in, in, in Bruges, uh, then you, uh, you didn't have to take a, a load of coins uh, over the distance and, and run into bandits along the way. You could get a letter uh, from the Medicis in Florence to their agent in, in, uh, in Belgium who would um, credit you with the coins there. And that worked. Um, it was much safer. Of course, it worked because you trusted the Medicis. You were trusting in the name, the Medicis' concern for their reputation. So it was, a, it was very much a system that depended upon knowing who you were dealing with. And that's, uh, that's been the case all along. Um, we went from gold and silver coins with supplements like that um, workaround, that hack, uh, to a system of paper currency backed by gold and silver, uh, which was, uh, uh, first of all, uh, paper currency was a lot easier to deal with than gold and silver coins. And also, it reduced the cost of the system because banks didn't have to have a, a gold equal in value to the amount of currency they issued when it was private currency. They only needed fractional reserves. So you had to spend less, less resources on creating uh, this money. Um, then we moved eventually to fiat money, where... The, uh, the, the, the currency is simply created by governments. It doesn't really have to be backed by anything except, except fundamentally the fact that you can pay taxes in it, uh, which gives it a, an underlying value. Um, and then more recently, of course, uh, credit and debit cards and mobile payments. And if you look over, over the, the long sweep, there's a steadily reduced uh, role of for, first of all, gold and you know, precious metals have disappeared completely from the, uh, from, from the way we do business. Uh, but even paper currency has played a steadily falling role with a footnote, uh, which is that there's a lot of $100 bills out there. I'll come back to that later. Um, but it's all in the direction of less and less resources. Uh, money becomes increasingly transparent, weightless, uh, ceases to be a major usage of of real resources. We've come closer and closer to just a pure accounting system that doesn't require a lot of resources to support it. Okay, now we have cryptocurrencies. So Bitcoin, which is the only one I even halfway understand, um, obviously makes use of the blockchain. Um, it makes use of this whole ingenious system of mining to validate uh, uh, bitcoins um, and to create more bitcoins. Um, it is, in terms of the long term historical trend towards becoming, towards reducing the cost of transactions, towards eliminating the, you know, using real resources to create money, which is after all just an accounting mechanism, um, bitcoin is a complete break from that trend. Uh, the transactions costs. Um, are much higher than they are in the normal system because uh, you, know, you have to, uh, a whole lot of information has to be transferred along with each Bitcoin. Um, the creation of new Bitcoins and actually the enforcement of the validity of the existing ones is very resource intensive. We now have, you know, it's, it's still a pretty small fraction, but a significant part of the world's electricity supply is now being used to create bitcoins. So we're, it, it's like the old days when increasing the world's money supply required lots of people mining gold, uh, which was something we had gotten away from, but now we're back. Um, and so if you actually think about not how clever is the algorithm, how futuristic it may seem, if you think about the economics, what we're really doing is we're using this clever algorithm, this ingenious system, to basically bring monetary economics back to the 17th century. We basically just stepped 300, 400 years into the past uh, with the use of the latest uh, uh, computational methods, which is kind of a funny thing to be doing. Um, now, obviously, um, it, as I say, the, 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 uh, the, uh, everyone says that the thing is really impressive 
in terms of the sophistication of, of how it's done. Uh, but you, know, you can do impressive things that are basically pointless. Um, if somebody wanted to, you could build a, a fountain pen that has to be refilled from an inkwell, uh, but that included facial recognition technology, so only I can use it. And that would be a very 21st century thing to do. It would also be a lot actually less useful than, uh, than a cheap ballpoint. Um, so the question you have to ask is, why are we doing this? What is the point of it? What, what problem um, is this supposed to solve? And that's where our people keep on falling down, at least in everything that I've been able to understand about cryptocurrency. Because, you know, the monetary system that we have, the system of paper currency, but increasingly also, and, and, and bank deposits, and then credit and debit, and mobile payments, and all of that, you know, it's, it works pretty well. Um, it's not as if we constantly are having problems with people abusing that system. Uh, when I listen to the rhetoric around cryptocurrencies, um, a lot of it echoes what gold enthusiasts uh, say, or used to say a couple of years ago. Um, there is constant talk about, well, this is, you know, putting things in, it, they're in the control of governments, and governments might abuse it, and they might uh, inflate away or otherwise expropriate, uh, expropriate the money that, uh, that we've acquired. But, you know, that hardly ever happens. I mean, once in a while, yes, there, are, there is a Venezuela now and then. There are regimes that uh, abuse the printing press um, and generate hyperinflation. But there haven't been many of those. It's actually, it's, it's kind of a, annoying for those of us who teach economics because we love to talk about hyperinflation because they're well understood and they're kind of fun to talk about. But we haven't had a good proper hyperinflation for, for quite a while and they, they've gotten really rare. If we look at the actual, if we look at advanced countries, you know, the purchasing power uh, of a dollar a year out is extremely predictable. It's, uh, inflation has ranged between you know, one and a half and two and a half percent uh, with not much variation uh, year after year. Uh, that's uh, uh, you know, it's maybe a little unfair for something new, but it's, uh, it's orders of magnitude more predictable than the value of a Bitcoin a year out. Um, and uh, abuse of the monetary system uh, by governments is actually pretty rare. Doesn't happen much. Uh, hasn't happened in the United States basically ever. Um, hasn't happened in advanced countries for generations now. Um, a lot of the gold rhetoric uh, went ballistic in the aftermath of the global financial crisis when people said, oh look, uh, governments are printing all this money and it's terrible, there's going to be hyperinflation. But it turned out that actually, you know, central banks, uh, my uh, former colleague Ben Bernanke, they said they were printing all that money uh, because they were trying to stabilize and, and rescue the system. And you know what? They were telling the truth. That was, in fact, what they were doing. And um, they did not set off runaway inflation. In fact, they probably made prices more stable, not less by doing that. They helped to avoid a 1930s-style deflation. So, and then they started pulling back as soon as the economy was recovering. So the, the fact of the matter is that the abuse of fiat money has not been a big problem. Uh, what other issues are there? Well, you have to, um, more or less, since most of us don't walk around with tons of currency, um, you have to trust big financial institutions. Uh, you, know, you put a lot of, a lot of the, the money you hold is actually uh, just a, you know, an accounting entry at those big financial institutions. Um, but that has also not been a source of, of major problems. In fact, because, uh, because big financial institutions are regulated, backstopped by the government, they've been pretty reliable. We haven't had a lot of people losing, uh, losing money in, in, in the uh, you know, 1930s style in modern times. So again, the question is what problem are we supposed to be solving? We've got an elaborate and costly technological fix, but it's not clear what, you know, cryptocurrency is an elaborate technological fix, but, but what is it fixing? Why are we doing this? Um, so far, you know, I, you know, I, 
I don't even know what's happened to Bitcoin's price you know, in the last uh, uh, few weeks. Uh, but that's really not telling you much. What, uh, for me, the acid test here has been, are we seeing a lot of transactions going over to, uh, to, to taking place via crypto? And the answer is basically not. Remember, it's, it, this is not a brand new thing now. We've actually had, you know, Bitcoin's been out there for a number of years, uh, and it's still really making no significant inroads into the ordinary payment system. Once in a while, you'll see some business announce, you know, Starbucks, that uh, we're taking cryptocurrency, but almost overwhelmingly, um, when legitimate businesses do that, they're doing it more for demonstration, for symbolism. It's a way of saying, hey, look at us, we're cutting edge, rather than an actual, um, you know, uh, a, a, a response to a felt demand that they accept payments in, in cryptocurrency. Turns out that it's just, and well, there's a reason. Um, actually, d doing business in cryptocurrency is expensive. It's awkward. Um, and if there's any time lag involved between you know, payment and, and, uh, and delivery of services or vice versa, uh, then the fact that the values are so wildly erratic uh, becomes a, a major disincentive. So there is a real, uh, I, I would say that we're so far seeing no evidence that this thing is actually working. In the, in the role of money as we normally understand it, and for good reason. It's, not, it's actually a, inferior to conventional forms of payment in terms of the actual business of, of an economy. Now, I did say one important word there, legitimate. And this brings me to, if, if you were going to make a case, particularly if you're going to make a case for the valuation of cryptocurrencies, it would hinge on not actually replacing ordinary money for ordinary transactions, but on more exotic and, if I might say, more dubious stuff. So um, we've been moving steadily away from cash transactions in the economy. Uh, the, uh, the share of, of actual transactions by value, actually by uh, even in terms of actual incidents involving cash, has been on a steady downtrend as far back as the eye can see. Um, however, if you actually look at the amount of cash circulating, in the economy. Uh, it turns out that the, the amount of currency in circulation relative to GDP, although it fell steadily until about 1980, has actually been rising since about 1980. Um, but then if you look inside that, you discover that the value of $20 bills and everything under relative to GDP has continued to fall steadily. All of the rise is in large denominations, basically $100 bills. So there's a lot of $100 bills out there. And what's that about, right? Basically, you can't use $100 bills for ordinary business. Nobody, almost nobody uses $100 bills for legitimate stuff. But if you are a, uh, you know, doing something that, uh, that's illegal, um, payment may well take place in $100 bills. We actually think that the majority of those $100 bills are held outside the United States. So you want to think of currency as being largely, you know, uh, it's caricature, but not too much of one. It's basically being drug lords uh, outside the United States making use. And that's the source of rising uh, currency demand. It's also, um, I should also point out that gold uh, is not much used for transactions either, but continues to have its value. So there is clearly a demand for stuff that is not for, not for currency, really, but as a, as a sort of easily transacted hidden asset. Uh, that's... Could that be the, f the future of, um, of cryptocurrency? Possibly. Um, there's, uh, as best we can tell, a lot of the actual use of Bitcoin is, in fact, for illicit transactions. Um, and w there it does have at least some advantage in the sense of being um, uh, anonymous, uh, you know, and, and having some advantages over actually porting around, you know, brown paper bags full of $100 bills. Uh, that, I think, is not the future that people envision, but it might be one. In that case, you know, if, if Bitcoin took off or all of the role of $100 bills in the current economy or the role of gold, then there could be a lot of value. But here's where I have one more problem, and I'll conclude here. Ultimately, when all is said and done, uh, we don't just rely on usefulness to give a currency its value. It has to be, I, I've been using the word tethered, and I didn't even realize until somebody pointed it out last week that that's a, 
that that actually has some connotations for the cryptocurrency business, but let's, let me use it anyway. Um, uh, other things out there are tethered to reality in some way. Gold, although most of the gold out there is actually being held you know, purely as a, as a cache of value, it's a, a store, a hoard. Um, gold can be used for jewelry, it can be used for filling teeth, uh, it can be used for various industrial applications. There is an underlying real demand for gold. Um, currency, even if it's um, $100 bills, is ultimately um, backstopped by the willingness of the government to accept it in payment for taxes. Uh, which means, if you like, dollar bills of any denomination have a value because men with guns say that it has a value. And, uh, and that gives a backstop. The trouble with cryptocurrencies is there is nothing. What is the underlying value? Uh, at the, the value of cryptocurrencies, value of Bitcoin, rests entirely on the belief of people that it will have value in the future. That makes it fragile in a way that existing forms of money are not. So that even if we imagine that there is a role for it in basically prohibited or regulated transactions, um, it's not clear that it, you know, if people stop believing in Bitcoin, it goes away. It's completely, it's completely depends on self-fulfilling prophecy, which is not a good thing to have in any kind of asset. But I, in a way, I think that's all kind of secondary. It, in terms of the big role of crypto, always keep on asking yourself, what problem does it solve? What is it, what, you know, not, don't, don't tell me about how great it is, don't tell me, you know, vague things about government control. Tell me exactly what is it that the current monetary system doesn't do that this does um, that justify the fact that it's actually a lot more difficult to do business in it. Just leave you with that thought. Thanks.